All right. Um, good morning still. Yes, good morning. Again, good to be up here again. Um, okay, so I am going to uh, talk about uh, uh, the suite of uh, technologies that will be the primary focus of my presentation to reduce NOx emissions. Um, and you just heard a lot of uh, great experience in technology development and deployment in Norway, so I'm, I won't spend a whole lot of time on the LNG side since the uh, bulk of the, really, the global experience lies in, in Norway. Okay. Uh, oh boy, we've seen these before. So this is the North American ECA again. This is the real driver for us to uh, reduce our NOx emissions again uh, coming up here seven months in uh, January 1st, 2016 to the tier three uh, NOx. Oh boy, I modified this one. Uh, this one actually has the, the NOx um, requirements um, on the timeline. <laughs> Slightly different. Uh, okay. And uh, that's, the, that's the requirement. That'll be the emission reductions from the tier one uh, emission standard. And again, uh, it, this is only currently applying to our North American emission control area. Um, otherwise, it's the tier, tier two NOx um, controls. And this is just an overview of what those um, emission standards for NOx look like uh, for tier one, uh, two, and Three. And again, why we care about reducing NOx um, from marine vessels uh, and ports. Um, so uh, many of you are aware that international shipping is, is a very major source of uh, oxides of nitrogen globally. Um, it's a major driver in the U.S. Uh, for um, our uh, health attainment of our air quality standards in particular. Um, some on the PM side, but really the real, it's a real driver for meeting our o ground level ozone standards, um, which is uh, something of, of concern in, in many parts of our country, particularly in, in California and Los Angeles areas in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, we have uh, NOx is obviously a major uh, contributor to um, the human health impacts. Um, and uh, the good news is, as we've already started to hear, is that these NOx emissions can be mitigated. And, you know, even newer technology coming onto the market here possibly and can help us uh, uh, expand the suite of options for reducing NOx uh, if we can get that plasma technology in, on, on board. Um, okay, uh, this is just the contribution. So I stretched these out a little bit. They look oblong now, but <laughs> they should look like pies. Um, these are the uh, ship contributions in the all across the United States. So this is not just focusing on California, which oftentimes we do. Um, this is the contribution in 2009, and then on the other side, the 2030 uh, contribution without an emission control area. So this is a uh, just another reminder of why we needed to focus on controlling those emissions. Um, the industry is growing, uh, the movement of goods is growing, the volume, the number of ships, and we're also addressing already a lot of the other sources of emissions in the United States on the land side, locomotives and uh, cars and trucks and things of that nature. Knox. Okay, um, <laughs> you've, you've, you've seen some great examples already. Um, so the, the major options that have uh, sort of risen to the top um, that uh, we have seen in, in the US and, and really demonstrated globally so far are um, selective catalytic reduction units, SCR, using a, a, a reagent, a, a, a reducing agent um, of ammonia or urea. Um, and obviously alternative fuels, you've heard about LNG and methanol, and I think there are even other technologies that are not in wide scale use, but are being demonstrated to reduce NOx. Um, uh, exhaust gas recirculation um, and water-based uh, approaches, uh, such as emulsified fuel and injecting water into the um, uh, uh, exhaust gas um, and intake. Okay, this is from, this is just showing a variety of the technologies um, and where they more or less come out on, the, um, on their ability to reduce NOx uh, by what percent. 
And you can see that the SCR and the LNG are um, pretty far up there. So those seem to be the, uh, right now, those seem to be the winning technologies, if you will, for reducing uh, NOx emissions. Okay, SCR. <laughs> So you, they are big. <laughs> uh, this, maybe this picture doesn't quite do it justice because it itself is so small, but they are enormous um, pieces of equipment um, that can be retrofitted or, of course, installed in new ships uh, is probably the easier way. Um, again, this is really just a, a reaction going on um, using a urea um, or an ammonia injection into the exhaust gas stream, uh, and that gives you some uh, N2 or nit uh, nitrate and um, uh, water, basically. Um, the uh, SCR has been in use uh, for a long time. Um, it was originally, at least in the United States and probably elsewhere in the world, it's been installed for many, many decades on um, land-based uh, stationary sources, large stationary sources like power plants, uh, for example. So there's a long history of the use of these technologies on, um, on the land side. Um, and there's also uh, a, a history of use here now and very effective in some of our um, smaller mobile sources on the land side, um, trucks and diesel passenger vehicles. I think it's going on in Europe a lot as well. Um, we do have, um, well, they all, they're suitable for the main engines and also the auxiliary engines. Um, and there are some examples here, <laughs> and there are others. These are just a couple examples of, of where um, the SCR has been used successfully in marine vessels, um, uh, clocking in uh, lots of use time um, for many, many years um, in some cases. Uh, successful, successful uses of SCR in marine. Um, the types of marine vessels that um, use, ha have a history of using um, SCR are uh, presented here. Um, lots on the carrier side, um, the patrol vessels, supply vessels, um, uh, tugs, um, as well as uh, the fishing vessels. I think that was, uh, that came up yesterday as a large source uh, in this region. And um, so some of the considerations that have been encountered in using SCR in marine vessels are when you encounter, um, when you're in a low power operation mode um, of somewhere around the 25% engine load, where the temperatures can fall below the optimal um, temperature for um, really uh, addressing the, the NOx, that's when the SCR can um, uh, fail uh, in terms of reducing the, the NOx because it's a temperature dependent um, uh, reaction. Some of the solutions to that um, include um, making sure that that temperature remains um, in its, op its optimal range, um, positioning the SCR system to uh, be ahead of uh, the turbocharger inlets uh, as one potential solution, um, reducing the level of the um, charge air cooling or modifying the injection uh, timing of the injection, um, and then using burn burner systems to lower the um, power operation. As a retrofit, uh, uh, we've heard this, I think, throughout today and maybe a little bit yesterday. As a retrofit, it's challenging uh, because they're very large pieces of equipment, and I think uh, we're all aware that the ships themselves have um, already are uh, packed <laughs> with uh, engines and tanks and uh, cargo and things like that, so it's hard to find space. But um, if space can be found, um, uh, there are um, uh, some uh, sort of challenges and then recommendations for um, installing the tanks, for example, to house the aqueous, uh, the urea solution that's used. Uh, in the reaction, um, so segmenting the tanks, the existing fuel tanks is one option. Um, I'd love to get some feedback on these two from the, the uh, folks in the room that are actually uh, in the field on this. Um, fitment uh, with you know, stainless steel or uh, plastic urea tanks is another option. And on the, uh, we've heard some issues about the actual production of urea and the availability of the urea. Um, and we did an uh, assessment that 
uh, showed, at least for in the United States, there's uh, ample, ample supply to meet the additional need that would be in, uh, in, induced by the tier three requirements, should SCR be the technology of choice with urea. Um, costs and implementation. So um, there have been a few estimates. Man uh, has put out um, an estimate around 95 uh, U.S. dollars per kilowatt, um, about 4.4 you know, million for a container vessel. Um, and uh, the urea and ammonia consumption costs um, are, are something to consider. That will be an additional cost, um, as well as some of the maintenance associated with it. Oh, thanks. Uh, um, those are additional considerations and potential costs as well. And then, of course, back to the training, uh, training of, of the crew to, to be able to um, use, properly use and handle um, the uh, urea. I know that that has come up in some discussions that I've been involved with, um, and that is the addition of a, a reagent or a chemical on a ship requires a lot more consideration um, uh, in terms of safety and uh, disposal and leakage and things like that. So that's something uh, that needs to be considered as well. Um, uh, NOx reductions, again, uh, very high, 80 to 95 percent are the estimates. Um, and our, uh, uh, our sort of analyses uh, show that uh, the tier three requirements in the North American ECA and, uh, and should they be adopted uh, elsewhere uh, in, in Europe and, and, and otherwise um, will really be the, the driver for these tier three um, requirements and hopefully bring down the costs of, of, of these technologies. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into, <laughs> you've, heard, you've heard from the experts here already um, on experience with using um, natural gas and methanol. Um, so I'm not gonna go a lot uh, into that, but really natural gas at this point does seem to be the, uh, <laughs> leading alternative fuel for meeting the NOx requirements at this point. Um, yeah, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I think you've, you, we, we, heard, we heard already what the state of the technology is and the potential application, and it seems quite, uh, quite promising. I think one of the main uh, issues that uh, we have, and I think this is not just uh, in the United States but elsewhere, um, is the if we're going to really be considering a large-scale fueling with LNG, so fueling of these large ships, for example, um, the, a lot of the discussions have <laughs> concluded that there needs to be some pretty hefty investment in the infrastructure. So. Um, uh, at the ports, if they want to uh, fill up uh, uh, LNG ve uh, vessels with LNG, uh, they they probably are going to need to do some sort of um, uh, liquefaction on site, uh, which is extremely expensive, hundreds of millions, if not more, th than that. Um, so that's but that's if we're looking at just the the large um, large ocean going vessel fueling. Um, I know there are other options, um, barges and trucking it in and uh, things like that if you want to start on a smaller scale, uh, for perhaps with the ferries and, and the tugs and, and things like that. And I think that's uh, <clears throat> just a discussion that's at its very beginning stages in the U.S. Um, on a larger scale is, you know, sort of where to start. Do we start with the small ships and then move up? Um, so. It's a, uh, LNG is definitely uh, one of the technologies that's, that's uh, very high on the, on the table in terms of addressing NOx emissions in the U.S. Yeah, here we go. There's, <laughs> so lack of bunkering infrastructure, some of the considerations, um, but the costs are, um, you know, favorable for um, SOx uh, emissions and potential CO2, you know, emissions as well. One of the concerns is, uh, uh, and I'd love to hear more about um, how this has been addressed, um, if at all, um, the methane, uh, methane slip um, in the engines. Um, that is, that's something that's, that's a concern uh, in terms of using any, any natural gas in, a, in an engine. Okay, so exhaust gas recirculation. Uh, this is uh, also a, really a temperature-dependent um, NOx-reducing technology. Um, Essentially, um, it is uh, reducing the peak um, peak combustion temperature 
um, to, to get the NOx emissions um, down. Um, uh, what we have seen is it's suitable for, for new engines, but might be a challenge for retrofits as a retrofit. Um, it is available on com uh, new engines, but there's a very limited, uh, as far as we're, we know, uh, limited demonstration as a retrofit, um, and that's one example of a retrofitted vessel. Some of the considerations for EGR. Um, include uh, potential increase in fuel consumption and uh, increase in PM. Uh, that's, that's brought up a lot. Um, uh, some of the potential solutions to that are, um, you know, these advanced electronic uh, fuel injection systems uh, with a common rail fuel injection system seeming to be one of the um, top uh, ways of addressing this issue. Um, uh, let's see, the costs are uh, higher, um, about 15% is the estimate that uh, we've been able to um, uh, uh, come up with, and um, it's, that's, compared, that's a tier three compared to a tier two engine, however, that cost increase. But again, uh, the hope is that with the rollout of the tier three requirements in North America and potentially other areas in the future, that will bring the cost down and, and bring these technologies into the market. And then water-based technologies, I won't go into these, um, but these are uh, some things that have been uh, researched and demonstrated at a very small scale as far as we can ascertain. Um, that includes uh, emulsifying your fuel with water, injecting in the cylinder, um, or injecting in the intake air um, to uh, control the temperature, um, suitable for new engines and retrofits, but again, the considerations are there are very few demonstrations. I'd be very interested to hear from others here if there uh, are demonstrations that have been successful in marine engines. Um, weren't, I wasn't really able to ascertain costs because there's so little uh, to draw from, um, but uh, the and the emission, the emission reductions are variable, and these, this is a one demonstration project that I'm aware of that had a decrease of 6% uh, um, to 12% NOx, um, depending um, on the load of the engine and um, the water content. And so the main thing there, I think, main barrier is really it's, it's such an early, early stage uh, technology that uh, we just need more data uh, and more demonstrations to, to show its viability. And I just want to, of course, remind everybody why we're doing this. Uh, we're very <laughs> interested in protecting public health and the environment. The lower, uh, this right here is really the, that's the, the ozone. That's what's, uh, what we're getting at when we reduce the NOx. Uh, so we want to reduce that ozone on the coast, across the country. Um, because it's very harmful to human health when, when people are exposed to ground-level ozone. And these are the benefits, um, specifically for the ozone uh, reductions or the NOx, the Tier 3 NOx emission reductions from the North American EGA, uh, projected out to 2020. Uh, so you can see that there will be um, some significant um, health um, and quality of life and productivity benefits uh, from implementing uh, the uh, Tier 3 NOx standards. And then the overall ECA, of course, um, has its uh, combined benefits of particulate matter, SOx, and NOx uh, reductions um, with a 35 to 1 to a 90 to 1 uh, investment. So return on investment. I think that's it. Thank you.